Okay, well, thank you, Chief. Uh, congratulations on your study. I, I think, you know, as I travel over the country, I, I'm gratified to see people like you who take an interest in the health of, of the people that work in this profession. It's been too long. It's been too long. Uh, for some reason, we have fallen behind industry in taking care of our people. And our people are unhealthy, they're becoming more unhealthy. They're dying at an earlier age. They're not making it to retirement. And when they do get to retirement, they're in such a poor condition that they don't last very long. So the purpose of, of this symposium is to get you from the point you walk into the police academy to the point you sign those retirement papers as a healthy person, healthy psychologically and healthy physiologically. And by the way, those things are very closely associated as we're finding in our research. So I wanna uh, talk to you about what I've done and what I've studied. Uh, we, we don't do much on intervention, and I think uh, we're going to eventually, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. What we're doing now is, is looking at causes of health problems among officers. And once we find those things out, we know where we should start to intervene. So that's our role. Your role and what I see going on here in Indianapolis and Indiana is, is the intervention, which is sorely needed, and I'm so happy that it started to go. As you know, I don't have to tell you this, uh, that being an officer today is a, a challenge. I mean, we're high visibility people. Uh, the social media is uh, on our case all the time. Uh, they're looking at us. If you're on duty for eight or 12 hours a day, for eight or 12 hours a day, you're subject to being photographed, to being videoed and everything you do. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to be an effective officer and at the same time deal with what we're exposed to on the road. That along with terrorism and the violence in our society that we see today uh, makes our job more dangerous. Uh, when I was an officer back in the Flintstone days, it, things weren't like this, you know, things, things were different. And today's generation has a real challenge in dealing with this work. And I, I applaud you for that. Kept Stefano Kales, who was going to speak to you next, uh, made a statement. He said, police work brings about unpredictable and stressful bursts of intense and strenuous physical activity, placing a high demand on your cardiovascular system. And the way one officer put it is this job's 98% routine and 2% sheer terror. And that's understandable to you, because you know those situations where you get into, whether it be a shooting or a foot chase or a car chase or whatever, that those times are very stressful. And I hear it on the radio when, when these things happen. I hear, it, I hear the trembling in the voices of the officers. Uh, I've been in cars where you're watching officers involved in high-speed chases and you can see them trembling and their, their arms shaking and their voices trembling. These things are very stressful. These are the things that hurt us. And Dr. Kale has talked more about this, but he, uh, he, done, he has done research on those particular situations and how they affect heart attacks among officers. Unfortunately, our body keeps score. When we're stressed out, uh, that damage, that little bit of damage that's done by every stressful encounter affects our body in some way. So the body keeps score of what's going on every time you're put under a situation of stress. Over time, those little incidents, those little damages in your body change the systems in your body. Those various systems that stay in balance that keep you and your heart and the rest of your system functioning properly. Stress affects those things. Um, humans only live on average, in, in our society anyways, to around between 75 and 80 years of age. And we'd live a lot longer if it weren't for stress. But stress attacks us. Stress damages our body over time. The important thing for 
intervention to come is how to manage that and how to teach officers who come into the academy and are in service to deal with that stress. And we all, this is all common sense stuff and you've heard it all before, but we need to get more proactive on this and not react after the problem happens. So stress, stress is dangerous. It is dangerous. It's probably one of the most dangerous things in this profession. We asked officers, uh, does a job affect your health? One study said 38% of officers said yes, stress especially. In another study, 68% said yes, especially stress. So we know it's a problem, you know, but how do you deal with it? You know, how do you deal with it? And that's the big question. Very briefly, and, and I'm not going over this, but this is our study we're doing now. This is a 12-year longitudinal study on police health. And what we're looking at is the effect of stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and some of the bodily systems that stress affects and how that affects cardiovascular disease among cops. And once we know, and once we follow people over 12 years, and look at the changes, we'll know where better where to look for problem areas to address on the job. But uh, this is our study, and it's, it's uh, too much to talk about but right now, but uh, thank goodness that we've, we've been able to get funding to do this and, and help officers get through this. Well, let's look at some of the problems. You know, and that's, again, that's what I'm here to tell you what some of the problems are that you probably already know about, but anyways. Uh, the police have a high risk of the metabolic syndrome. If you've never heard of the metabolic syndrome, it's a subclinical indicator of future heart disease or cardiovascular disease. Abdominal obesity. We measure the, the uh, ab abdomen, and if you have a waist size of more than 40 inches, 36.4 for women, uh, you have a component of the metabolic syndrome. If you have a high amount of triglycerides in your blood, you have a component over 150. If you don't have very good, if you don't have a very, uh, an amount of, uh, the, the correct amount of high density lipids, uh, the good cholesterol that we, we talk about, that's a component. If you have high blood pressure, that's a component. If you have a high fasting glucose, glucose uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the factor that can give you diabetes, you have a component. If you have any of three of these, you are considered to have the metabolic syndrome. What we found in looking at that syndrome is that 27% of the officers in our study had the metabolic syndrome, more than a quarter, four times higher in male officers than in female officers, okay. four times higher. So being a white Caucasian male officer in police work puts you at risk, significantly at risk for the metabolic syndrome. What are the police dying from? Wonderful topic to talk about, but I, I think we need to address it. We did a 55 year mortality study on police officers. What that means is we looked at police deaths over a period of 55 years, a long, drawn out, big cohort of police officers. And we found the following, versus the general population in this country, that all causes of death combined, all causes of death were significantly higher among police compared to the general population. We found that all malignant neoplasms, cancer, combined, were all significantly higher than the U.S. general population. We found that all diseases of the circulatory system, heart disease and other diseases, were significantly higher than the general population. 44% of our sample died of cardiovascular disease in total almost half, 35% died by age 60, 50% died by 65, 66% died by 70, and 80% died by 75. 
The earliest death age among our officers was 34 years, a very young age to die of a heart attack. The median age of death was 65. And the mean age of death in this 55 year sample was 68 years, oh, excuse me, excuse me, 60 years of, uh, 68 years of age. Well, what does, that, what does that indicate? That indicates that uh, this sample told us that the average age of death among our officers was 68. The average age of death in the general population uh, is much higher than that. It's probably around 78, okay. So as a cohort, as an occupation, we are dying at an earlier age than those people, those workers in the general population. Um, to me, that's a scary statistic, um, especially at my age. And I, uh, it all, it's very simple. I mean, if you take care of yourself, you know, if, if you have the support of your organization to, to give you the ability to take care of yourself, you know, <coughs> you're gonna live and have a happy retirement. And that, that's really the zero sum game. This figure here is a, a study we did on life expectancy. And just to give you an example, if you, between the ages of 55 and 59, okay, purpose in the general population has about a 1% chance of dying at that age group, in that age group. If you're a police officer, you have almost a 40% chance of dying in that age group, okay? That line on the bottom, that dotted line is the general population. That other line going up there is the police population. So you can see how much quicker the mortality rises in police than it does in the general population. You have an increased risk of dying because of your profession. Another scary statistic. And this was part of our life expectancy study that we did uh, recently uh, published in, uh, in a journal. And uh, again, scary stuff. Well, what does it cost you, organization, uh, chiefs of police, uh, people who handle the money, uh, all of those things that people that deal with officers? We looked at something called the years of potential life lost in the occupation. How many years did you lose among your officers because of premature death? And as a benchmark, we use the average age of retirement for police, which is around 57. How many people died before that average age of retirement? Okay. Our research suggests that the average years of lost among police was higher than it is in the general population. And most of that loss was among younger police officers. The departments lost 41 years of service, of potential life for every year for 55 years due to officer's death prior to the average age of retirement. Think about how much loss that is. 41 years of potential life lost what does that mean to the department? That means that you, if you lose an officer, you have to hire another one. That means that it's going to cost you a lot of money. You're gonna to have to train that individual. You're gonna lose the experience of the officer who died. And it's just, bottom line wise, it's very expensive, but more, more than bottom line, the human tragedy of losing police at a young age is even greater than that puts a real strain on person, on an officer's budget, on a department budget and so forth, and the loss of very valuable officers. Overweight and obesity, my next great problem in policing. Overweight, uh, if you have a BMI between 25 and 29.9, 29 you're considered overweight. If you have a BMI between higher than 30, you are considered obese. 80% of officers were overweight or obese in, in our study, in our cohort, 80%. Now, you can't tell me that that's not a problem. To me, I think obesity is probably one of the biggest health problems that we have in our profession. And the question is, why is that? 
what happens to that officer between the time he or she leaves the academy and gets on the road, does service, and retires? What happens? You know, what sort of training in the academy can keep an officer at a good weight or at a healthy weight over a period of time? What can we do better? Again, back in the old days, in the academy, it was, hey, when I went through here, I had to do 50 push-ups, kid. You're going to do 75, okay? Or you, we ran three miles, you're going to run four miles, okay? So what happens? Uh, it was used as punishment. Uh, that's changed in, in many academies today, but that's the way things were. Uh, we need to keep that going. I think exercise and, and weight maintenance and keeping healthy uh, should be a priority in one's life. Uh, uh, we need to make that true, and we, it starts in the economy. There's just no doubt. Obesity is much higher for police and compared to the general population. It's 40% versus 32%. Okay. The metabolic syndrome, uh, again, looking at the general population now, not other departments. Metabolic syndrome is higher in, in cops. Um, good cholesterol is higher. Reduced good cholesterol is higher in police. I think we went over this. Hypertension is higher. Um, again, part of our study. Um, cholesterol, not too bad. Uh, we were surprised to find it was around 200 on average among police, which is uh, the limit, if you will. Uh, some of the recommendations of, uh, of various medical organizations think it should be lower than that. Uh, 200 is, is, is about the line. Okay. The problem was that the, the, the good cholesterol the, was not, it was lower than it should be among police. Triglycerides were four times higher, and I mentioned that already. Mm -hmm. uh, blood pressure is uh, fairly high among police. Again, 27 versus 17 percent. Milwaukee study showed that one. Uh, what are the risk factors? Uh, things that are common sense things. Uh, Physical, irregular physical work, uh, poor diet, shift work, PTSD, high demand at work, and low job control. These are psychological factors that go on. And again, Stefano uh, did some work on that. He'll talk to you more about that. Well, you know, that's the bad news. And we continue to look at it, and we continue to research it. Um, we do work on, on post-traumatic stress disorder as well, because I feel and I have felt from my own experience as being an officer, a trooper, and uh, what I've seen through the years and how men uh, and women have suffered from this, um, that PTSD is a major psychological problem in our job, depending on the study you look at. Anywhere from 9 to 17% of our officers in this country have post-traumatic stress disorder. And in our study, we found that 35% in Buffalo had pre PTSD, meaning a, uh, a lower level of, of PTSD symptoms. Uh, but again, 17% had a higher level of PTSD. But this thing is making noise here. So it's an important thing in, in our profession. We're also find, finding high rates of, uh, of depression uh, among our officers and uh, high rates of suicide. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. The 2020 Healthy People Initiative in the United States, again, very common sense. Everybody knows these things, I think, but we, sometimes we don't pay attention to them. Smoking, uh, nutrition, very important, nutrition is very important. What you put in your body is extremely important. And we're all guilty of eating junk food and, you know, it, it, it's life. That's the United States. I mean, I, I look at ingredients on, on different things and every time I look at ingredients, sugar is in there. Sugar is the enemy. To me, sugar is the enemy. I, I, you need to be very careful and read the ingredients. If sugar is listed in the beginning of the ingredients, that means there's a high amount of, of sugar. Uh, diabetes is now reaching an epidemic proportion in our country. And uh, eating that stuff is, is not helping. 
we all know that fruits and vegetables are essential. Uh, there are different diets out there that are, are working. The paleo, paleo, I can't even say the word, paleothetic diet. Uh, there's various other diets uh, that um, are being tried out there that are, are very helpful. The Mediterranean diet, uh, Dr. Kales will talk more about that. Physical activity, extremely important, you know that. Uh, reduced obesity, uh, substance abuse, okay. We know, again, this is our research. We're showing that there's a high degree of uh, problems with, with alcohol in police work. Uh, it's a culture that uh, subscribes to alcohol use, sometimes as a stress reliever, sometimes as a social function thing, but uh, We've all heard of the, the, the old story about choir practice, you know, where after, after midnight shifts, the, the guys get together at the local bar and suck up a few and talk about the day's activity and go home sometimes drunk. Um, it's a big problem and we're dealing with it. You know, we have programs for alcohol. Um, drugs, to some degree, are starting to creep in. Mental health, we talked about PTSD, depression, uh, uh, suicide, there are, there are problems with that as well. Social determinants, including the workplace. We believe uh, in our studies, and we found that the support, support of the organization, critical, critical. We're all in this together. No, it's not me on the street against you in the executive committee or chief, it's us. We're cops, we're together, we gotta do this together. When you go into departments like that, and, and you have them here in Indianapolis, when you go into departments like that, you can see the difference in the people in the department. You can notice that. It's, it's, it's fascinating to look at that. And our research shows this. Support is essential. It reduces, uh, it reduces the, the rate of post-traumatic stress disorder in the department and depression. And not feeling that you're part of the group. 30 minutes of cardio, again, this is common sense that you've seen all this stuff and I'm sure you know about it. 30 minutes, perhaps uh, four or five times a week. Uh, less than vigorous exercise. I can never tell the difference between vigorous and, and normal exercise because I don't know how you measure that, but I imagine it has to do with, with the keeping in your target heart rate when you run or when you walk or whatever. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, more effective if you spread out you know, somebody told me that I like to work out in the morning. I'll go out at, and work on the elliptical for 30 minutes in the morning. Uh, but then, if you do that, you can't go to your desk or your patrol car and sit for the rest of the eight hours or 12 hours that you work. Because if you do that, it's not helping you. Uh, get one of these, uh, these Apple watches to tell you, every hour it tells you, get up and move, get up and walk, okay? And that's a good idea. Get off your chair, get out of your car, walk around a little bit. Uh, you need to do that to keep, your, uh, keep yourself intact. In but if you sit, you do 30 minutes of exercise in the morning, you sit the rest of the day, it, it's not gonna help your, your, your cardiovascular system. Resistance training is good for your bone health. Uh, one of the studies going on right now is with the astronauts. You know, they're, they're weightless. So they're floating around in space and there's no resistance on their bone structure. And they're ending up getting osteoporitis or osteopenia because their bones aren't getting resistance at all. Resistance training helps your bone health tremendously, plus it builds your muscle, and muscle burns more calories than fat does. So uh, that's an important thing to add into your, your repertoire for, for exercise, uh, weight training, lifting weights, and so forth. Balance and stretching is also very good. Uh, yoga uh, works very well, uh, not only for stress, but for, for stretching and so forth. Look for ways to move, and we, we've talked about that, and uh, take the stairs. Uh, a lot of people at my place where I work are getting standing desks, where they, the desk basically comes up and they stand and uh, they work uh, while standing for a period of time. Uh, Again, walk around. Don't sit in your car all day because that's not going to help you out. Uh, cardio, balance, weights, bone density, uh, sports activities, uh, 
a good way to have fun and get exercise as well. Your diet, um, good protein in the morning, uh, eat your main meal in the middle of the day because you burn all those calories off by the end of the day. Uh, good carbs, veggies, fruits, we, most of us know about this stuff. Uh, easy on the red meat, um, chicken, fish are better, better choices. Omega, is a, you know, reduces oxidative stress, and oxidative stress can aid you. One of the things I found in the research is that people at a high degree of oxidative stress um, age quickly. Uh, we're thinking of doing a study now on, on something called telomeres. And telomeres are little dingly things off your DNA which uh, get depleted by stress. And if too many of them get depleted, it ages you quickly. And if you age quickly, you die quickly. So we're going to look at the association between stress and these little telomeres at the end of your DNA system and to see what effect that has among police officers. Sleep. Critical, critical, critical. I, I can't exempt, I, I can't express how critical that is. Not having sleep uh, can mimic d dementia. It's like you, you can forget. Now, I, don't, I know most of you have worked midnight shifts. I, I have too. In fact, I worked nights for eight years. And uh, you can forget things. And that can be dangerous. Your action time slows down if you haven't had enough sleep. You can't solve problems or logic reasonably if you've had not, have not sleep. And the health studies are showing that there's a, res, a, a risk of insulin resistance. And what that is essentially is the, 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 the um, receptors. There are receptors in your, in your body that sense when glucose gets too high in your blood and uh, the insulin is secreted by your pancreas to reduce the, ins the, the glucose. Um, Insulin resistance occurs when those receptors get resistant to the insulin and they can no longer reduce the glucose and your glucose goes up and eventually you're going to get diabetes. So working shift work has been associated with, with diabetes. Working shift work has been associated with, with cancer. In fact, the World Health Organization has told us that shift work is a possible carcinogen, for a possible relationship to cancer. Um, the nurses' health study done in the United States found that nurses who worked shift work for 18 years had a significantly higher rate of breast cancer than those who worked day shifts. So there is some evidence out there. It's not clear, but there's evidence out there that shift work may be associated with, associated with cancer increase. Adults require about seven or more hours of sleep a night. Um, again, shorter than seven hours. And this is the uh, joint consensus statement of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Uh, sh shorter sleep dur duration has been linked to heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and a lot of other things as well, and safety issues. There's an interesting comparison done here uh, between uh, alcohol and sleep loss. If you have lost eight hours of sleep, in other words, you got no sleep at all, that's equivalent, in terms of reaction time, that's equivalent to 10 or 11 beers and equivalent to a blood alcohol level of 0.19. So if you go a whole day without sleep, you're around a 0.19 BAC in terms of reaction time, in terms of how you react to things. If you've lost six hours of sleep, you only had two hours of sleep that night, you're about a 0.10. If you only had, if you've lost four hours of sleep and you had four hours of sleep that night, you're about a 0.095. And if you only lost two hours and you lost six hours, you're a 0.04. So it's essential that officers get a good night's rest. Now, Sometimes this is impossible. And again, just relaying my own experience, working nights, two hours later, got to go to court, got to go home, got to fix the refrigerator, it broke, the washer's not working, got to take care of the kids, got to get them to soccer practice, okay, get the family going, you know, maybe go to dinner with my spouse, go back to work that night, 
So how much sleep did I get? Two, three, four, five hours, go to school. Okay. Um, that's the candle burning on both ends that, that police officers do. And uh, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy for us because it, it, it's, going to, it's going to hurt us physiologically and psychologically. Inflammation of the arteries, we're finding this in our study. We, we, we study arteries by, with ultrasound and we can look how well uh, arteries respond when we, we block them, we occlude them with a, with a little uh, sleeve here on the arm. And we release the cuff and we watch the, how well the artery expands. Well, if it doesn't expand very well, it's not very healthy. So our officers who work night shifts had less expansion of their arteries. They weren't as healthy as those people that work day shifts. So we're looking at an association here between being up all night and having circadian disruption affecting your arteries, your cardiovascular system. Disruption in eating patterns on night shift. What do you, where do you eat in the night, at nighttime? There's nothing open, you know? Uh, maybe a, a greasy spoon where, where the mice run through the butter. Maybe there's something like that where you can go have have uh, eggs cooked in, uh, you know, two pounds of grease or, or whatever. Uh, maybe that place is open if you're lucky. If you're lucky, you have a place open that has decent food. But we use the, the Hutchison Cancer Diet Research Survey to look at our diet among our officers. The diet on night shift is high in carbohydrates, high in fat, and uh, just plain unhealthy compared to day shift workers. We looked at the injury rate at night shift is four times greater on midnight shift than it is on day shift. Four times greater. Risk of being injured is four times greater. Okay. What that tells us is that officers are not getting enough sleep. What can you do? Go to bed the same time every night. I know that's hard to do when you're in night shift, but and rise the same time in the morning. You know, that's a good suggestion because that gives you continuity, it gives you balance, it gives you the ability to, to keep steady in your sleep. Quiet bedrooms, uh, dark, relaxing, not too hot or cold. Room darkening shades if you work nights. Turn off TVs, computers, mobile devices, and so forth. Uh, the, the effect of light, it's interesting, wakes you up. You know, if you've got a TV on, like, you know, a 40-inch screen or something, and you're watching it and you're trying to go to sleep, it's not hard, it's, it's not hard to, it's gonna be hard to go to sleep. And the reason is that um, the, the hormone melatonin is secreted when your body's starting to slow down and ready to go to sleep. Light, melatonin is a, a correlate of darkness, okay? So if it's not dark, the melatonin's not gonna kick in, and if the melatonin's not gonna kick in, you're not gonna go to sleep, okay? A lot of people take melatonin to try to get them to sleep. Uh, so having light, and in fact, some of the therapy that they're using now for keeping people awake on night shift is light therapy. Having bright light in a room to keep them awake, okay? Uh, but if you want to sleep, you know, you can't have a lot of light in your room. So turn off things uh, like TVs and so forth. Avoid eating a whole bunch of food and drinking and smoking and all the other things before you go to bed. So it'll keep you up all night. <sighs> Lastly, uh, our suicide studies have, have been immense. Uh, we've, we've looked at this for years and years and years and uh, it's still happening. It's still, where people are still dying out there and unnecessarily, tragically. Uh, um, a study done by the Badge of Life, and this is not this is not pure science that, that this group's doing, but it's, uh, it's an estimate or an indicator of what's going on. California had the highest suicide rate. Uh, the average age of death of our suicides in this study was 42. Average time in a job, 17 years. Sergeants are above 22% of law enforcement suicides. Five of those were chiefs. You talk about the stress of middle management and policing. You talk about the stress of being a chief. My God, you know. They're stressed all the way up and down the ladder, from the guy and woman on the street 
to the person on top of the heap, it ain't no different. Okay? Everyone experienced stress. Middle management, I think, in my opinion, is one of the most stressful jobs you can have as a police officer. Uh, being a sergeant or a lieutenant or a captain, in that range there, you know, you're, you're dealing with the people on top, you're dealing with the folks on the street, you're dealing with politicians as well. The dimensions of what you have to deal with are, are really, really strained. 80%, 7% were males. We are seeing an increase in female suicide. Uh, the monthly, weekly report from the uh, Center for Disease Control said that women in protective services, that includes police, fire, and anyone who does protective services, has increased significantly over the past year. So women are now exhibiting a higher suicide rate. Gunshot, 80%. The IACP has come out with, uh, the Officer Safety and Wellness Program has come out with Breaking the Silence, a national strategy that they're using to address officer mental wellness and suicide. The cornerstone strategies are culture change, virtually impossible, I won't say impossible, but virtually hard to do. How do you change this indoctrinated culture that we have on this job? One researcher said that Trying to change the police culture was like bending granite. And I agree with him. You know. How do you change this culture? Well, y'all in Indiana are, are trying to do that. You know, there are programs here that are looking at that. We were talking about this last night at dinner. And, um, that's the secret. To me, reducing the stigma of coming forth for help is probably the biggest block we have. Police don't like to say that they have weaknesses. It's not weakness you have, it's a sign of strength you have if you come forth with a mental health problem. If I break my arm and I have a cast, my fellow officers aren't going to sign their names on my cast. If I have depression, my fellow officers aren't going to avoid me. They're going to lose their confidence in me. My leaders are going to lose my confidence in me. I won't get promoted. These are the fears of officers who have mental health difficulties. Real fears, but fear is greater than logic. It wins every time. And how do we deal with that? We have to reduce the stigma. We can do that. We can get officers to come forth with their problems get them solved, get them back on the road, get them back to work where they belong. So that's tests that you all have to do, and you know, uh, good luck, it's, it's difficult. And having early, early warning systems and protocol, a good training, training is essential, especially at the recruit level, to make sure that recruits understand that they are, um, their exposure may lead to mental health difficulties like depression, like PTSD, uh, if they have problems, let's, let's address them. Let's address them. How to respond to suicides in, in, in uh, departments, we've seen problems with this. Um, depending on how and where the suicide and how the suicide occurred, uh, there's no, a lot of departments don't have policy on what do you do? What do you do if there's a suicide in your department? Do you have, do you have a military funeral? Uh, do you go in uniform? Do you not go at all? Do you go in civilian clothes? Do you go on duty? Do you go off duty? Uh, is suicide different, a different type of death than, uh, than a police homicide uh, or a, uh, you know, an on-duty death? Uh, something to consider. You know? And again, it depends a lot on how, this, how and why the suicide occurred, but there, there needs to be um, some sort of policy in place to deal with that. I like uh, Dr. Kerry Kuehl, uh, someone I've talked to about this, and his, his approach to intervention was this, let's do it as a team, okay? He's demonstrated that working as a team works better because officers, number one, start competing with each other. Number two, they keep each other in check as far as health goes. 
And number three, they can all look at their progress together and enjoy that. So the team format, according to Dr. Kuehl says, it helps each other stay away from the donuts and take the stairs instead of the elevator. Okay. The SHIELD program was, was a program he, he started up. And it's worked very good. There were four goals, again, very common sense. Physical activity, saturated fat, trans fat, reduced fruits and veggies, energy balance, and normal body weight. Those were the goals of the team. Now, if you didn't meet those goals, you caught hell from the rest of the team, okay? So it, was, it kept each other in check, and basically it worked very well. Rather than an individual trying to, to get an individual to try to improve their health, uh, the team essentially as a group lent support and lent uh, um, a check mark to get you to continue your program. You discussed the goals. Uh, there were questions to answer out loud. You had to, you had to profess out loud. You had to weigh in. And uh, it's positive. It's positive, perhaps a way to make a life change and change your habits. So uh, there are ways to do this. Oh, I forgot to mention, we uh, recently got a grant from National Institute of Justice and to study the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder on the ability of you to make a decision on the street. And it turns out from our pilot work that, and what we do essentially is we do brain scans on, on police officers. And what we found out recently is that if you have a high degree of post-traumatic stress symptoms, that you're gonna have difficulty in making a decision and this is a lab experiment, okay? But what it equates to is that if you have high degree of PTSD and you're out on the street, you cannot recognize the difference between acting and not acting on a particular situation. And that's what our study showed. We call it a no-go study, a no-go response. You either go or you don't go. And we set it up in a lab where they, they uh, recognize something or they don't recognize something. So equate that to the street. You're in the street and you have a situation and you have PTSD, you're gonna have difficulty in discerning what's good, and what's bad, what's dangerous, what's not dangerous on the street. So when we finish this study, and it's a three year study, we're gonna to try to determine, number one, what is that effect on a larger basis than we have? And number two, what can we do to deal with that? And there's a certain type of training where one can deal with to, to increase cognitive, what we call cognitive flexibility, even under conditions of strain and stress, and how to improve that. And that's something we need to work out and haven't got to yet, but that's our, that's our next goal. We are now continuing our 12-year mortality study, our four-year cardiovascular study in stress, and we wanna go into 16 years. Um, we wanna look more into shift work because it's, it seems to be very deleterious. You know, circadian disruption of the body, of the body is, uh, is very uh, um, harmful. And you combine the disruption of your sleep patterns with stress, and it has a synergistic effect. You know, together those things really hurt your body in the long run. So my advice is get better, get well, uh, listen, to those programs you have here, which are great. Indiana is, is one of the leaders in, in wellness. And you got it right here. Just, you got it right here. You can have a happy retirement. You know, I have, I have a great retirement. I enjoyed it. Um, as one, one officer told me, he says, you know, I wanna, I wanna get, I wanna take the state for everything it's got, you know? He said, when I retire, I want to live a long time. I want to enjoy my pension. I deserve it. I put my life on the line for 20 to 25 years. I deserve a retirement. And I deserve a healthy, happy retirement with my wife, with my grandchildren, and the rest of my life. And um, I totally agree with that. So God bless you. Uh, take care. There are people out there who, who do care about you, regardless of what you see in the social media and the press. 
the majority of people in this country are on your side, and they care about you, and they need you. They need you. You're the last line of defense we have against the evil that's in our world. So God bless. Thank you very much, and uh, pleasant help to all of you. Mm -hmm.